Abby Callahan, and I live on Fuller Street, which in our backyard goes up to Heaton Woods, and that's my interest tonight. Great, thank you. Welcome. Uh, Colleen Wilford here. Hi. Steve Search. And we live on 40 Liberty Street, and um, Although our property doesn't abut on the Heaton Woods property, it does have the potential to obviously affect um, the area. So that's why we're here. Awesome. Steve Wendelson, I'm Abby's neighbor on Fuller Street. I abut directly onto the Heaton property. Great. Anyone else want to introduce themselves? Yeah, no I'm pressure. Ter I'm Teresa Murray Clausen and I'm on three Woodrow um, and I abut Washington County Mental Health's parking lot. So I've been neighbors with Washington County Mental Health for 26 years. Um, but we also own another home on Heaton, um, which is right where Woodrow turns to Heaton um, that abuts um, onto Washington County Mental Health also. Okay. So um, yeah, I think that gives us an idea of what item on our agenda is of interest. <laughs> um, okay, well, it, for the sake of time, so we have plenty of time to go over everything, I think maybe we'll start the meeting and um, we have a quorum of the Planning Commission uh, and we're missing just a couple members. So I think we can, we can get going and they can join us as, uh, as they come. So with that, I'm going to call this September 30th meeting of the Montpelier Planning Commission to order. Uh, it's a special meeting. So in a way, it's not at our normal time, but this is the reason why this is at a different time is because we're working on the uh, city plan right now, which is taking up all of our normal time. Um, so, uh, First thing we have to do is approve the agenda. So if the planning commissioners will take a look at the agenda for tonight and when ready, we'll take a motion to approve. I move to approve the agenda. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion from Barb and a second from uh, Stephanie. Um, anyone need any more time? Okay, those in favor of approving the agenda, say aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? Okay, agenda approved. Uh, the next uh, item is comments from the chair and I'm just going to briefly uh, go over the what the plan is for tonight. This meeting is devoted exclusively to uh, some um, potential zoning changes that have come from members of the public. They've asked the planning commission to consider uh, adjustments to the zoning. This happens from time to time where we just kind of do all of these suggestions together. It's like several months worth all at once that we take a look at. Uh, when we analyze this, the idea is to take that public input and consider uh, whether our um, zoning is not working out the way that we had hoped uh, when it was first passed because, you know, no one's clairvoyant and these things come up and we learn new information and we, you know, make policy decisions um, in response. Uh, I, I just want to reiterate because, because it's when these things come up and they're sometimes they're property specific, it can look like we're making changes based on a particular property, but that's not really the analysis we try to do. We try to look at the whole city, the, our, our um, plans for the whole city, and whether these adjustments uh, are necessary to fit that. It's not, in other words, we consciously try to avoid spot zoning. That's like, that's not something that we want to be doing here. Um, another thing about tonight is this is a special meeting for us to learn about uh, the background here for these proposed changes. This meeting is not the hearing on this. This is just an informational session with Mike so that we can learn a lot without spending our regular planning commission meeting time doing it. 
Um, Mike, am I correct in thinking that we had scheduled the hearing for the next planning commission meeting? Uh, won't be, it'll be scheduled. It'll have to be a warned hearing. So we'll have to go through a full warning process and it's probably going to take a couple weeks. It probably wouldn't be till November. Um, so a, a lot of, you know, because we'll have to send out a lot of public notices as well to people who are going to be impacted. So there'll be a lot of notice that we've got to put out. Um, so yeah, this will be, it'll be a couple of weeks, probably closer to six weeks, probably before we have enough time to get all the notices out and get everything uh, okay. lined up. So I, I guess the other point I would add to this is the, the meeting gives the planning commission opportunity to, to understand what's being proposed. And if they decide there's something they don't want or don't think is appropriate to move forward to hearing, um, they can certainly strike something from the list um, that's there, but you know, a vote to move this to hearing doesn't necessarily commit the planning commission to vote to approve it after the hearing. You know, sometimes it's something that's just like, you know, I'm not opposed to it, but I'd love to hear from the developer on their idea of what they're looking at doing or why they can't meet the zoning currently. Um, so they'll put it to public hearing so they can hear more from the developer. But the first one is generally about um, making sure that when we have the public hearing that the planning commission is familiar with the rules and uh, familiar with the proposal so we can maximize the amount of public input um, rather than having you know um, an hour and a half of of the planning commission asking questions and then a, a small amount of time for the the public we want to you know when we get to the public hearing we want the planning commission already understanding the understanding it generally and then we can invite speakers from the developers to neighbors to everybody else who's there to kind of give input and then then the planning commission can vote at that point to go through and say um, these should be approved and sent to city council for consideration by the council or these won't be and these will be um, so that's that's the general big picture of where we're at right now in the in the process yeah great thanks mike so yeah the big takeaways are we are not be going to be doing a final vote tonight and um, this is an informational session, so we're all, this is also not the public hearing time. So um, it's it's awesome that people from the public are here. But just so you know, if you if you want to provide input directly to us on this, then this meeting is not the place for that. It will be at the hearing, which sounds like will be in either the second or fourth week of November. Okay. Uh, does anybody else have any questions or anything before you dive in? And, and I'm going to just hand it over to Mike to, to walk us through everything. Anyone have anything else before we do that? Okay. Um, but, well, according to the agenda, though, we do have a general business section. So we have comments from the public about anything not on the agenda. So just in case anyone's here to talk about something that's not about the zoning changes, but just anything else that they want to tell the Planning Commission, um, now would be the opportunity actually for that. Does anyone want to do that? Nope. Okay. Oh. Okay. Uh, I'm going to move on to the fifth item on the agenda then, which is to review and comment on proposed zoning changes as presented by the planning director. And with that, take it away, Mike. Okay. So we'll try to... Um, it's always up to, to you guys how much time you want to spend on each one. There are 10 changes. A couple of them I think will be really quick and a couple of them I think there's going to be more conversation about and questions about. So I'll just jump right in and I don't know if you guys would want me to oh, decide how I want to do this. If I want to share my screen you guys want me to share the screen to show you, or do you guys all have the printouts of the of doubt? I think you may as well share. Yeah, share the memo that you that you put together, and um, then we'll use that as a guide to walk through, maybe. Where are you? 
Oh. I can I can share it uh, over. Yeah, I might have to have you share it. It's been my apologies. Yeah. My computer died at work, so I've been having to work from home. So what ends up happening is a lot of the most recent memo I sent you guys, I sent from home. So it's not on my work computer, it's on my home computer. So um, all right, so um, the first proposal, um, and hopefully um, people can get oriented to the first image. So um, the, right where 9-4 is, is Main Street. And that's heading towards uh, on the to, towards the left is heading towards the uh, the school, and uh, to the right it's heading uphill. And so what we're looking at is um, the highlighted area in red is mostly Harrison Ave. Also includes Whittier and uh, a couple of properties on Liberty Street. So we had a proposal um, from somebody who has a a house and accessory apartment and they wanted to add um, a, another tiny house they had room for it and they had the ability to put it in but they don't have the density and so looking at the zoning map um, what we noticed was that a majority of the developed land around it um, so neighborhood nine four and neighborhood nine three are both residential three thousand the parcels here are very similar in size and character to those parcels as well, so it made sense that um, it would make sense that this area would be could be rezoned for residential 3000. Um, I think I have in here that there's uh, 19 parcels, four of them are non conforming um, that would become conforming. Uh, and that would. Um, obviously make it a, a small difference. So uh, we try to be as conforming as we can. Uh, and the amount of development that it would allow or create is, is modest. Um, it would help this developer to be able to put in a tiny house. It's not gonna make um, extreme change. Um, yes, when you look at the numbers, it, it says it, it would you know, double the density, but it's not technically doubling the density. I think we've all been through this analysis before doesn't actually work that way. Um, but uh, that is the proposal. And I guess I'll leave that open up to questions to you guys. I'll just say that I'm, I think this seems like a reasonable decision to me. I'm, I'm on board with more density and close proximity to downtown. So I think this is a good change. Mike, how did the um, that particular street end up as Res Six Thousand anyway, since it was adjacent to Res Three? Yeah, not sure. Um, these neighborhoods were originally um, kind of cut out by Brandy when she was working for us, and I don't remember this ever coming up for reconsideration at any other time. So I think it's simply this is where Brandy drew the lines without really recognizing. You know, she she is uh, was our consultant who is not from the area, and I just don't think she maybe understood that, you know, the similarities. Um, you know that that it really this is really part of our our core downtown, um, and and isn't as much of a residential six thousand neighborhood as you know say Marvin Street or College Street. Could I ask a question? Um, does road size, sewer, you know, is there something about that taken into account here? Because would Harrison is a much smaller road than the ones around it? There are yeah, there are a couple of roads that are very similar that are also uh, like that. I'm, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. The, the road on the other side of Main Street um, that goes up to the cemetery and then cuts back down. Um, you know, that's that's another relatively small street as res 3000, even though it's probably a less developable street than than this one is. Um, Isn't that Lincoln Ave or something or Lincoln Street, something like that? One's link. Yeah, one's Lincoln and the other one starts with E and it's escaping me right now. We have a project. Ewing, Ewing. Ewing thank you. 
But is that part of the process you look at is, you know, what the sewer and all the, uh, that aspect of what can be held on a street, you know, what, what's available already? Is that part of the process? Uh, the, the sewer and water is very, very rarely a limitation. Um, only in the, the, the largest redevelopment, um, everything down here would, would have enough utilities and facilities to accommodate those, those developments. This is a case where um, we've run into this before, where one side of the streets has a somewhat different character than the other side of the street. So, but we don't want to split zoning districts down the center of a street. So, um, because the, I'd say the parcels that are on the south side, this is oriented correctly, right, Mike? Yeah, this is north, south, east, west. Yeah, okay, right. So the, the ones that are on the south side of the street um, tend to be larger, um, have um, more space available uh, than the ones on the north. But we want to zone that whole street in a similar way. Okay. Um, that's good. So we, we have 10 items. So uh, let's go ahead and move along unless someone has something right. else. So yeah, unless people have an issue with it, it's at least worthy of going to public hearing for conversation. Um, notices will be sent out to all 19 property owners in that in that project. Um, so the second project, a second proposal that has come in is uh, the proposal it was actually from washington county mental health so this is across the street so this is if you were looking at um heaton street which is the, the number 10 is basically sitting on heaton street if you're not familiar with it um and so if you were going north on heaton street it would be the property on the right is owned by washington county mental health the property on the left is uh heaton woods long-term care facility um so the proposal uh, that we received or the request we received was on the right hand side and what they wanted to be able to do is to bring in some workforce housing and uh, basically uh, they, they're having problems recruiting people and so uh, what they want to be able to do is to provide their employees housing so they wanted to put in some housing units in there but they lack the density one observation that we had is that this street happens to be um, somewhat unique in its character in comparison to the rest of um, that same neighborhood. So 102 is a very big neighborhood. It's called College North. It includes, um, as you can see on the map, basically everything that is um, north of East State Street, uh, Marvin Street, uh, Liberty Street, up into um, even up Main Street to, to 250 Main, I believe, is all in this same district. It, it goes way out and is uh, north of the VC, uh, uh, VCFA. So it's a rather large chunk. But these two properties tend to be very unique if you compare them to the rest of that neighborhood. So um, the one thing when we were looking at this and observing was that the buildings here are significantly larger. Um, you know, the 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 max footprint for this neighborhood is 2,500 square feet, but uh, Heaton Woods, for example, is uh, 18,000 square feet. So, you know, these are significantly larger structures, and we felt we could um, make a separate neighborhood out of them, and it would not be really um, something spot zoning because they really are unique in their character when compared to the surrounding properties. Uh, we follow property lines as much as possible in our zoning. It improves our ability to administer uh, our zoning. So that is why we follow the property lines. Uh, and so the idea was we would take the hospital and we would take Washington County Mental Health and change them to Res 3, which is one zoning designation less or above, depending on how you're perceiving it. Um, it's a shift of one zoning district, um, which would give them the density to be able to develop a little bit of housing on their property. Um, 
so that's the general thought behind it. It's, you know, there is no proposal for the Heaton Woods property. Um, you know, it is recognized and we recognize that the there is uh, a lot of on that 11 acres there is a lot of undevelopable land we acknowledge that and accept that but they could develop in areas that are in the existing frontage um, if there was interest in redeveloping in the future this would give some ability to put a second story on something you know it's a 40 bed facility could it be expanded to you know a 60 or an 80 bed facility in the future uh, don't know you know, I don't think anyone is planning. I think I would wouldn't expect anybody to be deciding that they're going to try to be building in the wet, steep slopes of the wood area. This is going to be something where we would anticipate if somebody did some redevelopment, it's going to probably be infill redevelopment on the. I'm going to guess three acres that are probably up by the road, um, and not the eight acres that are in back, extending out to. Um, actually back down to Harrison Ave. Um, so that's the, the summary of how we got to where we are um, and what the proposal is. Mike, was there a certain, was there a certain number of units that Washington County Mental Health felt that they needed to have? Because they could develop some under Res 6. Was it just not enough? I don't believe they have the capacity to um, because they already have the building that is there is rather large and it takes up um, a lot of the development potential goes away because of the FAR use of the mm. three and a half it's well, it's, a, it's three stories above a basement and it looks like it's a finished basement from the road view so I think it's a full four story use of that building um, mm. uses up an awful lot of FAR and that uses up the, the potential residential density that could be developed. Are there residential units in it now? I'm not, I don't know the details of, of that. I don't think it's a residential facility. I believe it's a, it's office um, inpatient facility. Um, but I'm not, I, I wasn't sitting in on the, on the, the proposal. They sat in with the, the zoning administrator to talk about a proposal. And that was when they discovered they wouldn't be able to do the project. Um, felt that because we were entertaining a zoning amendment, um, they asked if it would be reasonable to rezone this parcel. And I said, well, we can't just do one. And we that's why we examined it in context of its neighborhood and looked at that in context with long-term care facility across the street. So I just, I also uh, wanna point out if we, if we um, make the first change, which I'm definitely for, everything that's on the, the north corner of that parcel and down. Not down. It sounds like you froze up, Stephanie. No, nope, I think we lost Stephanie. Mm -hmm. Sure, oh, she'll well, be back. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully yeah. she'll be back. Go ahead, um, well, I assume what Stephanie was going to say is that it would make it all kind of more contiguous res three, um, which makes sense. And I just want to say Thanks. a couple things. Um, I just I just moved right by this property and I'm really in support of this. Um, I think we really need some workforce housing and the parking lot that's by this Washington County Mental Health Building, which I believe is all offices currently is you know has i walk by it every day and it has like two cars in it so it seems like a really underutilized um piece of land and i also believe that um just for people's knowledge i believe behind heaton woods most of that property has a conservation conservation easement from the vermont housing and conservation board where i work um I don't work in the conservation side, so I don't know that intimately, but I know we did a conservation easement when we funded the Heaton Woods project. Um, and, you know, it would be really difficult to expand Heaton Woods, but that's also like something that's really, you know, in need in this community. So I, I support this rezoning. 
Well, I guess I would point out that that uh, accepting number one does actually only makes the northwest corner of the Heaton Woods parcel adjacent, fully adjacent to Res Three. That still most of that is surrounded by Res Six, as well as the Washington County Mental Health parcel is completely surrounded by Res Six. So it's sort of it. I just, it bothers me to insert something into the middle of a um, zoned area um, that um, is strictly because these two non-conforming properties, which have always been non-conforming properties, um, just to try and um, do something for them. Whereas, you know, it does seem as if they have been integrated into the neighborhood now um, but if they were to significantly increase, I, you know, I guess I would have to wonder how many, Mike, how many units um, would Washington County Mental Health be able to put in then um, if we did this and went to res, six, uh, res three? I don't have the number. I don't know exactly what the number is that they were proposing. Um, you know, if this goes, if this goes to the public hearing, then, um, the, the developer will be at the hearing to kind of go through and answer what questions they can. I mean, obviously some of some of what they're doing now is conceptual plans. So, um, so they're gonna be trying to get back, uh, tr try to, you know, figure out what they can do before they can put in an application. They're kind of stuck at this point, not being able to move forward because they just don't have the density to be able to put some air. I don't, I don't think it's a it's a big I don't think it's a big proposal. Um, um, it's something next to the parking lot. Um, yeah. Ariane, you said something about the you know the conservation easement. So would that actually reduce the available land for development for well, heat the woods? conservation easement is on the other side. I realize on the heat woods okay. side. Yeah. Well, I think it would just now, I mean, you know, even if Heaton Woods sells that property, there's going to be an easement on it. So I'm just right. What does out. the easement, what does the easement mean? Oh, in terms oh of yeah. I mean, it, I don't think you can't develop it. I, I don't, I, you know, again, I'm not on the conservation side of things. I'm uh. on the other side of things. We could look into what the easement says, but I, you know, I think it's open as a, for natural and recreational use. So it, it limits, it, yeah. you can't build on it. The, 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 the easement's, the easement's gonna have different terms. So like without actually having it, we won't know, but. Right, I mean, the yeah, question. Some, yeah, sometimes you're selling the development rights, which means there's no development to transfer. In some cases, it's just putting an easement that says you can't build here, but they could go and pull the underlying development up to um, a developable portion of the property. Um, so, you know, if there is a conservation easement, and I, I heard from Bill that he thought there was, I didn't want to go and put it in the memo without having the backup to support it. Um, and I haven't been in the office to be able to do the homework on it. But I had heard that there was a conservation easement on the back half, um, but we'd have to, it would be up to, and usually we don't look these up. Usually we leave these up to the developer. If somebody came in from um, Heaton Woods and said, hey, we want to put another 40 units. We're going to, you know, we're going to put a second story on. We're going to put another 40 units. We would go through and say, you know, get us all the information to demonstrate that you have that that land because there's a conservation easement back there. And they would go through and with their attorneys highlight the fact that the conservation easement says no building past this line, but it doesn't take away development rights. So those development rights can transfer. The, the easement's probably filed with the deed, so I, I'm. It's probably a public document that that people could. Yeah, it'd be a title, just a quick title search. I mean, yeah, it, it seems in order to consider this, since the Heaton Woods uh, parcel is such a large portion of this, that we would really need to know what kind of an easement it was uh, to be able to evaluate this, because if it just transfers the development from that steep slope area to the top of the to where the building is now um, could end up with a considerably larger building um, as a result of that. Or it could send, end up with a lot of additional housing units as well. 
because they won't fall into that to that restriction based on FAR with all of the land area. Is that right, Mike? It depends what they're proposing. Um, FAR applies to concern uh, co applies to commercial and the um, in in certain congregate living. So depending on what they were looking at doing, um, you know, whether it was uh, an assisted living or a senior living, you know, if they added a, a wing of senior living, that would be using the dwelling units minus the FAR that they've already used. And if they're adding more congregate living, then it would have to meet the FAR requirement. I mean, given the fact that we're including this, it seems like we need more information about heat and woods. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good idea. And for, for the hearing, hopefully we'll have information about the conservation and the other things. Um, before we move on to the next item, I do want to make a kind of general point. Later on on, uh, on this list, uh, there's, there's a discussion of doing some other density changes and doing away with density in some neighborhoods, not these. But um, one thing I'd like to put in people's minds is we like I, I'm really interested in having a discussion citywide and having people thinking about density and what it's meant to do and and its and in its limitations. And so like we're this particular item is about density and density is just really about the number of people or the number of units, but it's about the number of units, but that means the number of people essentially in a place. And overall, this the city wants over and over again, we talk about how we want more people living in Montpelier, especially in the walkable downtown. And what we want to preserve is the aesthetic parts of our community that we really like, but density doesn't protect the parts that we talk about that we want to protect density just keeps people out which is goes against what we always say we want so just in general i just want to put in people's minds that like it'd be it would be great if our community can think about density differently and and also all of the planning materials that are out there right now are 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 encouraging this and this is this is something that planners across the country are encouraging and we've and we've learned about that and read about that um, so I just want to, I just want to like, just, I, I want to bring it up because I think it's relevant here, but it's also, you know, something we're going to directly talk about later, but again, yeah, yeah, Herbie, I, you know, as you know, I, I don't quite fully agree with that assessment. Um, but I think the biggest issue here is not necessarily how many people it is, but how consistent the massing and scale of the building is in the neighborhood. So consistency so, with the yeah. neighborhood is really the critical and, element. And so but, but that 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 uh, that touches on what I'm talking about too though because if we change the density here we're not we're not changing anything in the zoning about the mass and scaling as you said. Like the those regulations would all stay the same. There would be the same limitations on the mass and scaling that that exists now. It it really is this change is really just about number of units and therefore number of people. Right. I, and I guess there's, I'm looking now at, um, am I looking at it? I'm trying to compare the elements of res six and res three, since that's what we're looking to do is to change these from res six to res three. And essentially, what is that going to allow them to do that we they cannot do now? Um, and Um, and so essentially, I guess it would be sort of a more of an analysis in terms of the height and massing. You know, if they're going to add another wing to Washington County Mental Health that's four stories tall, I think we would have some concern about that. So um, in terms of, yes, these are unique, unique buildings in the neighborhood, but they are in a neighborhood. And that's the part that I think we sometimes ignore so mike can you tell us about i mean my impression is that that mass and scaling would not be affected by a res six to res three change and 
Am I incorrect in thinking that? There are some minor changes that are in there, but the building footprint is max is 2,500 square feet still, and the max height is still 35. So when they go to build a new, and it's not gonna, it's not um, an addition, they wanna build a new structure, whatever that new residential structure will be, it'll have to be, it can't be bigger than 2,500 square feet, which is the same whether you're in res three or res six, and same with, um, height of 35 feet, they would not be able to go above 35 feet. So just because the one building is non-conforming, it doesn't give them the right to make another building non-conforming on the property. Mm. So they can't build a four-story, um, I can't even, I don't even know how big that building is. Huge. <laughs> Probably 5,000 square foot footprint, I would imagine, at least five to six to 7,000 square foot. It's a, it's a good build, good size building. Um, but wow. yeah. Uh, the difference is that right now with the density requirement of 6,000, they don't have any available density to use. Um, so going to three means there it's not really a change in bulk and massing. There are some minor changes to your setback requirements. Um, you know, setback in front goes 15 to 10. Um, I don't think, you know, again, we, when we get to the public hearing, we've got to be clear that the zoning approval is really, we have to be thinking about the district, in this case, only two parcels, but we have to think about the district. We're not approving or denying an application. They're going to have to put in an application. They're going to be required to go through whatever design requirements. Um, there would be a major site plan requirement. So the aesthetics of the building would be um, taken into consideration. There'd be my, um, major site plan require, excuse me, major site plan requirements that would come into effect. So we would have to be looking at landscaping and um, fixing any nonconformities with respect to landscaping and lighting. So um, there are a number of pieces that would come into this um, and be taken into effect um, when it's an application. Um, at this point, what we, you know, need to kind of note is that we're trying to approve what the ground rules are for when applications come in. Um, and as I said, I kind of laid out why when they came in to say they felt the zoning probably didn't appropriately match their their particular cir circumstances we tended to agree and come up with a an alternative recommendation so can i ask a question about uh you know as a, a like you say a huge building and the talk about infill and using existing buildings are they didn't want to consider actually making their existing building into some kind of housing it seems like that would be like the perfect sort of solution to add, you know i don't know how much of it they actually use but as you said, yeah, I don't have the answer to that. Um, they apparently felt that they needed um, additional building space. So um, that would be a question that commission could ask them, but yeah. I mean, well, the other, the other concern I have is just that now we're taking not one parcel, it's true, but we're taking two parcels and they're we're potentially making them into their own neighborhood because they're going to be a neighborhood of res three that and no longer contiguous with the res six that's around it so um and that was something that was mentioned in the memo that they might have their own neighborhood designation um uh that makes me nervous in terms of this is a slippery slope i guess that these could be brought up in in various places in the city um where people um have buildings that are non-conforming to the uses surrounding them so yeah that's a that's a good point that's something actually we should maybe hammer out before the hearing like like the pl planning commission like what are you thinking about uh you know we numbers one and two here are adjacent to one another do we i mean do people do people have thoughts on making you know the the areas that are in one and in two into their own neighborhood that way so then that's more than a lot more than two parcels or just you know the other options are to combine them with nine three or combine maybe one of them with nine three and the other with nine four um, i mean there's there's different ways to slice this up and um and also obviously i, I want your thoughts on that mike i mean i know you, you've thrown some things out there but i don't detect that you're have like one way that you're committed to but. my sense with harrison ave is it would be attached to nine three it really is Okay. most to that neighborhood um, 
geographically and, and, and really is not nine four is are the properties that front on Main Street. And I don't think this Harrison Ave is not of the same character as somebody who's fronting on Main Street. They are more like a property that is fronting on Loomis Street, for example. Um, yeah, that's a good point. The secondary. And then, and then okay. And then uh, this I, other I'm one trying, I felt would probably be its own. Because, because the frontage between these parcels is like, yeah, pretty far away from 93 also. I see that. Yeah, and it's and it also comes down to the character of the buildings. And you know, we can describe that in, you know, each neighborhood has its own description and we can kind of describe, you know, the uniqueness of the the you know, the Heaton Street neighborhood, um, which is really only two parcels, but they're really two very unique parcels. Um, you know, and at some point in the future, if somebody felt if they were in a budding property who said, you know what, we're we used to be part of the Heaton Hospital as well. I'm not really familiar with that street. I mean, I, I Google drove it and I've walked it. When I first got to the city a couple of years ago, I walked all the, as many of the streets as I could to kind of get a feel for them. Um, but if somebody had a property that was abutting it and felt that they were of the same character as these buildings, they, they could come in and request it. And it's, I think, getting to Barb's point, I think we just have to take these one at a time and evaluate them. and. Um, you know, if, if there are two unique parcels on a street, you know, does that really make them unique? I think in these cases, these are so extremely, my opinion is, these are so extremely different that they, it, it could be argued and justified that they are kind of a unique little spot. Um, mm -hmm. Had a little bit of this conversation out at, um, the old Woodbury College um, on Route 12. Mm -hmm. You know, we kind of had that conversation about it's kind of, you know, what is this near? What is this like? I mean, this is this is kind of a, a, a unique property out here. This old this college campus, brand new building sitting out here, and uh, you know, what do we do with them? Uh, eventually, we combined it with the um, child care facility across the street to create a neighborhood. It's just kind of all right. That that's you know they you know none of the buildings really match those single family ranches anything around them. Um, and I think we just try to tackle each one of these as as they come up. In some cases, we're going to say, um, you know, I think two fifty Main. It'd be interesting to see what kind of and two fifty Main. I think sits out there and is just. It is on its own. Two fifty Main. It's just is sitting on its own. Mike, so, is, um, is it possible to show, you know, I sent you and Kirby both um, a topo that was provided to me um, of this prop of these two properties, which also show the adjacent houses, not just the lots. Can you share that? Because I can't share it on my Zoom. That's um, Kirby. I could, I could I could pull it up, Barb. I mean, what do you what are you hoping to communicate though? I, with that? What I want to communicate is having more to do with the character of the neighborhood and the um, the houses around it. So um, that's what I'm trying to, to show. And of course, also the relative um, area that's developable within the two parcels is pretty small. So what we want to, you know, what we're, we're saying to them is, well, you could come in and, you know, nursing home is not going to be viable any longer. You take that building out. And in its place, you could put 150 units. So it's, you know, that's a pretty significant number of residential units that could be built in that space at, at Res 3. Yeah, I, I mean, we, I think, yeah, I don't, I don't think I need to pull up the map. I mean, we, we take your point, like, I, I get that. And, um, like, well, somebody did like, do some work to provide that map. So if you yeah. have it, it's, yeah. Um, yeah, I, th I think I think everybody everybody gets the point there that what, of what you're saying. Um, I, I was actually hoping to find other people's thoughts on the uh, on the item and specifically about how the neighborhoods are divided up. Like we have Mike's uh, suggestion about having a new neighborhood here. I just want to see what other people's thoughts are about that. everyone in favor of 
And as opposed to sort of grouping it into, hold on, I'm nine three or nine four. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, grouping with nine three is an option. I mean, there's other things that we we haven't talked about that are options, which would be, I don't know, uh, the the neighborhood south of there. If we wanted to say that that you know it makes sense that that these parcels are part of that neighborhood and maybe that whole neighborhood should be res three or something. I don't know. I mean, that's just like a hypothetical thrown out there. Just just to see what people's thoughts are about the neighborhood question. In terms of the, the neighborhoods, I mean, I've I've generally been just against the concept of them in general in terms of what the amount of work that has gone into creating and dividing them to to very little there's no real reason or there's no real public and it's like I, can, I, can, I don't understand why we do create them like we need to just divide and separate everything into these clean lines when like it's not like it's part of the neighborhood it's what it is and our neighborhoods aren't these like monolithic streets of homes that are exactly the same and then as soon as something's different like we categorize it as something something else when it really has no implication on what the zoning regulations are. Like if we if we care about um, aspects of design, then we have to define those in terms of criteria that need to be met, not not the description of a of a neighborhood. Again, there's no feel it's like it's almost misleading in a way that we we have these descriptions of neighborhoods, and then it's like well. Here's the description of your neighborhood. It doesn't really mean anything. Here are the rules that someone has to follow. So we spend a lot of time talking about it. I don't know why. But I'm aren't fine. the descriptions, the descriptions are part of the rules for the neighborhood. In what way though? If you well, follow- Well, in terms you, of looking at terms of character of the neighborhood. Um, that's why, that's the reason we put them in there. If you remember, um, because if we were going to say that something needs to be in the character of the neighborhood, we need to define what the character is. Yeah, and we can't necessarily do it by rules. Well, I guess I would. I guess I would uh, differ there. If you if you meet all of the design requirements and the use requirements, um, you'd be hard pressed to make the case that something is uh doesn't conform to the character of the area well i guess yeah i guess we will differ on that john because i certainly think you uh there are a lot of um elements that you can look at and um it's you know pretty clear to see um what is in alignment with the character of the neighborhood but I mean, that's not what we really need to talk about here, but I just want to yeah, um, if there's something specifically sure that, about it about the neighborhood that we want someone to follow or not do like let's let's be clear about it. Not the other say like here's here's like a general qualitative description of the neighborhood and and whatever you build should feel like this. Like, yeah, we need to we need to articulate exactly what we mean. But the other value of the neighborhoods, don't forget, too, is that we have capital area neighborhoods now that are maybe not following all of our neighborhood lines, but at least, you know, it is important to designate neighborhoods, to my mind. Um, Marcella is very politely raising her hand. Thank you. <laughs> I just wanted to say that it seems to me like um, that parcel goes down to um, the street, like the north side of that parcel to Harrison Ave. And so I would be in favor of just making the Washington County Mental Health, this whole, you know, if we were to change the other one to Res 3, change this one to Res 3, just incorporate that parcel into the, it looks like it would be the 9-4 neighborhood, but if it's 9-3, then great. I would, that would be my, that seems like a simple solution to me, and um, that's what I would vote for right now. 
Yeah, th thanks. And um, one thing I'm hearing from John is he's he thinks the whole concept's flawed, so he doesn't really doesn't really matter if you put it in nine three or make it its own. It's still like the same flawed thing. Is that? Yeah, I guess it was a long-winded way of saying I'm happy to go <laughs> along with whatever everyone else. Says. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I realize yeah. okay. we're not going to toss all of them now. So, yeah, um, and I, I, I get I get Mike's point too. That uh, like the these pro parcels interact with the street, like their fronts are um, on what's the name of the street there? Is it Heaton? Heaton Street? Yeah. So they and so since Heaton is way off of Harrison um I get that too I yeah so I, I, I can make this part of nine three so we can get going and then that'll give us the ability to you know at after the public hearing there's always the opportunity to make changes and the people feel having thought about it for a couple of weeks that you know what it better to be a different neighborhood then we can make the change then but right now I can group it into nine three and we can keep the move keep it moving and Barb, it sounds like you you had concerns about it being its own neighborhood. So if if you're having to choose between either make it nine three or make it its own neighborhood, it sounds like you would favor nine three also. Is that correct? Um, no, I guess I would say none of the above. <laughs> so uh, I wouldn't favor changing it to Res three. So yeah. um, so that would not. I mean, it wouldn't necessitate a separate neighborhood because it's already part of a neighborhood now. Okay. How would you how would you feel just just hypothetically? How would you feel if we were making all of ten two res three? It would all be that part of that same neighborhood, and uh, so it wouldn't have that problem you just pointed out. I guess I can't, I can't express what I just thought in the public meeting. Um, I would say all of ten two into res three. No, I mean, the whole point of doing the, the, these particular zones, these districts, was to accommodate the existing layout that the new zoning would, would accommodate 90%, I believe we ended up with 90%, of the existing lots would be therefore legal. So it, to me, that does help to describe the character of the neighborhood. So the character of this neighborhood in general, other than these two parcels, um, is lots um, of 6,000 square feet with one unit on them, with one house. Um, so I think that that definitely adds an element of the character that, as John said, we need to be, we need to have rules about it. Well, that is certainly one of the rules. So I can't really see the point of doing that. Okay. Um, okay, so I, th I think uh, I think we're good to move on to number three. We're probably going to need to speed things up, but because um, we have we have about an hour left. <clears throat> All right. Hopefully, number three will go a little bit quicker. So this is one uh, for anyone who's been paying attention. This is um, the Habitat for Humanity project. So the large green uh, orienting people. The number 7-4 is on Northfield Street, and it is sitting, the 7 is sitting on top of the Econo Lodge, just to give you guys some orientation of, of where this is. Uh, the 9-6, that's kind of those uh, large stately homes that are up at the top of the hill there on, I believe it's Cherry Street and maybe Pleasant Street. Um, uh, and uh, so Hill Street is coming up on the east side, so it kind of touches the parcel on the east side. So what we've got for a proposal is relatively uh, small in number. There are only two parcels involved. Um, and it will move the, the bl dark black line is design review. So under the old, the old map, there was a, um, the large green parcel also is part of one of the orange pieces. So it really is two parcels. You've got that little piece uh, that's down at the very south. Um, and then the next, what looks like a parcel above it is actually part of the, the larger green parcel. So we would just be changing the designations to res nine 
which is that light blue color. Um, so they would really be kind of become part of that um, other neighborhood. And I don't see the name of it right next to me. So that's the proposal. The similarity, so what they wanted to do is, and, and the general concept is when we developed our zoning map that anything that did not have sewer and water became rural. So this was designated rural because it did not have sewer and water. They planned to extend sewer and water up into this parcel and wanted to have the benefits of this being zoned Res 9000. Um, we have a very similar scenario over on Crestview. So if you look, remember back off of Terrace Street, uh, Alan Goldman owns a very, very large parcel that is zoned Res 9000. It's an interior piece, but it had previously gone through Act 250 and never got built, but it was kind of platted out and laid out to be a subdivision in there. It is still zoned Res 9000, um, even though it's an interior parcel. So it's not, this is not a unique situation for us to do just for this application, um, but uh, it's, it's a project. There, there is an idea to run a new road up in there, to do a development up in there, and in order for them to do their uh, Habitat for Humanities project, they would need to have this rezoned for Res 9000. So, um, and then we would just clean up that little corner over there um, to kind of make those all match up to the to the Res 9 character. So that's the, a little bit of the history and background of this one. So, Mike, how how steep is this lot? I'm trying to get a it's, sense of the topo here. It's got some steep st spots in it. Yeah. Uh, there is a location, they have had it engineered where there is a path to get a road up. The development is not near Northfield Street. It's going to run a road up into a flat, on the top of the hill is a flat area. Um, it would be within the sewer and water um, uh, pressure. So while well, sewer always works, it'll be going downhill. Uh, water pressure would reach this point. Um, so they feel it's going to be a very expensive project. I don't know financially, you know, they're going to have to work some wizardry to, I think, to make this all happen. But, um, I think if somebody wants to take a shot at, um, running, running a new road, running sewer, running water up, up the hill, um, they're gonna have to put a sufficient number of units to make it cost effective, basically. So, you, you know, you're not going to spend a couple million dollars putting in roads and sewers and water and just build 10 units, you, you're looking at a, a 50 unit project at least. Mike, can I share my screen? I've got the topo up. Uh, Kirby great. would have to un, undo his. Thanks, John, that would be great. I also, while we're pausing for a second here, I wanna, based on what Barb was just saying about matching up the neighborhoods, I fully get the idea that we're the zoning was defined in a way that we wanted to make sure things were conforming and i but based on this sewer and water comment and also just thinking about what barb had said i just i want to make sure that we're we're thinking about zoning as not just what's currently on the ground but what we want to see in a location and that's that's more important to me not just that we're mapping what's currently there but that we're allowing for uses that we want to see in those areas so that's my high level zoning thought <laughs> for what it's worth. So um, if you look, um, you know, I can't control the cursor on this. So uh, John would have to point to it. There is kind of this ghost of a line that's going up to, to a cluster of three or four buildings. Um, if you're across from the Econo Lodge, you can kind of see this uh, kind of, it's kind of a ghost of a, of a road that you can see in there. There it is. So that would be the road. So it's going to come up, it's going to go past these structures, I don't know if they're staying or going, and then it starts to follow some, uh, it, it goes up and it, it hits a, a switch back and then starts to follow up some of these gradients until it gets to the top of the hill. And then at the top of the hill is where they would um, lay out a set of streets to, um, to accommodate the development. Um, I believe, I mean, I'm not going to put words in um, uh, Watson, uh, his, his project, um, but, you know, he, he understands their paths and their stuff, and he's part of how his funding is supposed to work is that he's going to be working on conserving pieces, working with folks to, you know, 
um, put in trails and work. So he's trying to he's trying to cobble together money from a number of sources because you know there's a large parcel. Um, this is part of the town that doesn't have very many parks. You know, are there opportunities that we can? You know, this isn't just about you know habitat. It's more than just about um, you know making money for habitat for the humanity. Uh, they're 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 good stewards, good neighbors, um, and so they're they're looking to put together a good project. Um, so that's they're they're going to be getting funding. So this will be a project, as I said, that'll that'll need a lot. But one thing that it needs is um, to be able to get in the door. And right now, as zoned rural, it isn't feasible. The the prospect of parks over there is is really appealing. I mean, we talked about that when we were discussing the parks chapter of the city plan, where you know we want to do studies to find out where park needs are. But I think we're all aware that this area is definitely one that's very lacking. Well, I'll just say again, simply, you know, I, I'm, I support this change. I'm, I'm really excited about, I don't, again, I don't know whether Habitat can pull together enough funding, but I think it, it would be great to take a take a shot and you know it's again it's just going to be on the the flat portion of the um of the development as i understand but to add add housing units seems really exciting to me how many units again mike is is potentially uh, they were talking around around 50, but they're they've just gotten they're they've applied for a community development planning grant, which will give them the ability to to start to to study things out and determine all of the details. You know, they they might find out that this project is only feasible with 80 units, um, and then they'll have to decide if they can do 80 units. I mean, that that's what the planning grants do is they you start to put ideas down and start to follow the money and see, you know, how much, you know, per unit cost, this is an expensive way to do it. You know, you want to do affordable housing and build roads and sewers. That's a pretty expensive way to do it. Um, but um, it's also one if you can get the sewer and water in there, it could give you a lot of opportunities um, once you're up to the top of the hill. Um, so yeah, and yeah, conversations about Sabins is like is that that's forty units, right? Uh, no, that's that's a potentially there. I mean, they're talking seventy four units. Oh, seventy four. Okay. Last I heard. So we'll, is, we'll, okay. we'll see when something comes out there. This this might be just yeah, a little smaller than okay. And uh, so we're talking about changing it from rural to to Res Nine, and that would also include those two parcels that you see right there um, at the bottom. So, um, yeah. so actually, one of those. So actually, if you were looking, if you were still looking at the other map, what you would see is there's a little bit of a jog where these cluster of five buildings are. Those are already zoned Res 9. And then as you keep, if you pan to the north a little bit more, John, um, if you can, you'll see that one parcel is, in, is a separate parcel, and then it comes back, connecting back in. So that parcel would go to Res 9. Um, yeah, so you can see it's a little bit different, but basically what we're doing is we're taking this corner and making the entire parcel plus this little one all to be res nine uh what they're currently zoned those two little slivers there are currently zoned mixed use residential which is a commercial zoning district that is a single family home so we um and, and we looked down here at these other ones um and i believe these two are multifamily. and we decided we, we evaluated whether or not we should move them into the res nine and decided that it would not be appropriate based on their current use and their current layout. They're probably, um, because they're already multifamily, makes sense to keep them in their mixed use residential des designation. 
So again, okay. I would be sending out notices to everybody who's got uh, is an abutter to this property as well as to the properties that are changing um, in the note hearing notice. And that'll be a lot of notices. A question of how you choose Res 9, why not make that Res 3 and pack in a lot of housing if you want new houses? Like what, how do you guys decide Res 9, Res 6, Res 3 on this one? Uh, it's, uh, so Res 9 is, um, the 9,000 is the number of square feet. So that's one unit per 9,000 square feet. So that's about quarter acre zoning. So four units per acre. Um, they'll probably end up doing a PUD um, which we'll talk about later. Um, so on a 60 acre parcel, 60 times four, 240 units, they have no need to go to putting what would be an awful lot more units. I, I won't even try to do the math in my head um, to go to res three. That's a that's a good question though. Wait, that 240 yeah, that you just stated is that res nine? The downtown, but we don't want to squeeze housing into the place. Maybe that's more open. Uh, well, um, I, no, I think we are interested in squeezing in housing. But um, did you, Mike? Did you say 240? Uh, I believe if it's if it's 60 nine? acres, I want to guess it's about 60 acres. So if it's four units per acre. Four times 60 is going to be 240 possible units up in there. Um, okay. So, John, and there's a lot of unbuildable, unbuildable, nasty land up in there. There's, um, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be. So, a okay. So, so res, res nine, realistically, res nine is a, matches know, it like colonial. It, if, if you were to look to just to the north of this, um, there's colonial drive, freedom drive, all of those, freedom way, th those are all classic quarter acre zoning. So if you're thinking about, you know, these areas to the south, excuse me, um, they're very classic. Um, those loop-de-loop -loop roads, those are all, you know, classic res nine, quarter acre zoning, a um, couple of bigger parcels in there, but for the most part, that's what you're thinking of. Um, they're not gonna be doing them this broken up because there's not a lot of developable land, which is why they will be doing a PUD when they're up in there. And we will talk about the PUDs about two or three numbers down from here, and we'll, we'll get so, to it. I do. I do want to. I do want to uh, revisit um, a, a point Eve was just making, which is that you know one thing that we think about a lot in these meetings is uh, walkability and not relying on cars and hoping that our development can um, match you know transportation in a way in which our community can be you know not car centric. So this like neighborhoods like this, it's kind of like not as conducive to walkable to downtown where a person can live without a car. So and that's why if if this neighborhood or this area would be less attractive for more um, condensed development, it would be considerations like that. But but what it sounds like is if, if we make this change, then potentially a PUD can be put in here and it can be developed pretty much to the full ex extent that it could be with res nine. So, um, you know, if and if we they, could, if they can, if they needed more density, they would just have to come back and ask for another rezoning and you guys would have to consider whether or not it's appropriate. Um, right now, this is what they've asked for. Yeah. It sounds like, it sounds like some of us would be up for, um, and you know, a res six or something, but, um, it sounds like it's that it's not needed though. Uh, okay, does anybody else have anything else on this item or should we move on? Okay. Let me grab the screen back from you, John. All right, so hopefully the next one is relatively quick. This goes back to our Res 9. We were just showing a few of the Res 9 neighborhoods. There was a proposal to reduce the side and front setbacks in Res 9. Um, the front setback is 20 feet, side is 15 currently. And I conducted a review of all of the existing Res 9 neighborhoods and found that for the most part, they are in compliance with these setbacks. Um, in a few areas, some of the setbacks would make structures non-conforming. Um, you know, uh, for example, actually on the on the previous 
picture if you had it still there um, a little bit of the Derby Drive area is Res 9, and those those structures had a few non-conforming. You know, if you wanted an example of one place that did have a few. Um, so I think the front setback is fine, considering there is a provision in Section 3002 G4, which allows the administrative officer the right to reduce front setbacks to match the two closest structures. So if you have a neighborhood like Derby Drive, some it doesn't meet that 20-foot front setback, it's still okay because the zoning administrator can match it to your neighbors. So if they're at 16 feet, then you can be at 16 feet. So I don't think there was a need to change that one. Um, but I think there could be room to reduce the side setback to 10 feet. This would eliminate some nonconformities. I, I didn't have a big push on this one. This was a request that, um, you know, there are a couple of people who came in and we kind of had a little bit of a trend where we found it had a couple pe people that came in from these neighborhoods and I said I would look at it. Um, so I wouldn't change the front, um, but I would maybe consider moving the side setback to 10 feet. Um, What's a good like, reason for keeping the front setback? What's that? What's a good reason for keeping the front setback? At 20 feet? Well, most of the others you know if you were to look at you know colonial drive as i just mentioned those are all at 20 25 foot setbacks um if we're trying to kind of match our character um you know the character of the neighborhood our zoning regulations and rules match what's on the ground that's what's on the ground um you know um otherwise you'll have ones in different um like i said it's just it's just consistency and character um I know you probably don't care if there, <laughs> there are some yeah, that, the, the, some the quality of life would deteriorate if someone put a mudroom on the front of their home. <laughs> You'd be surprised. Just gotta sit in my office and listen to the complaints come in sometimes. Um, hey, Mike. I'm sorry. It's just unclear from what's written here. What's the specific? What are the proposed reductions on both the front and the side? Ten on the side and what in the front? Uh, there, there was a proposal to reduce the front. It was twenty feet. They didn't really give us a number in in the planning office. They just said, you know, that, that you know they wanted to put some addition, and you know it didn't meet the zoning, and you know there was a lot of nonconformities in their neighborhood. And I said I would look at the at the zoning for Res Nine to determine whether or not you know, maybe those rules just weren't consistent um, or, or accurate. You know, we, we kind of took a lot of what Brandy did with, a, with you know, a lot of trust that she went through and did it. And for the most part, I think she did a fantastic job. Um, a lot of her stuff when she said, hey, the, this is 90% of the property setbacks for Res 3 and 1500. And, and most of those were spot on. Res 9 had a little bit of mix, as I pointed out. You get to a Derby Drive where things are a little, you know, still Res 9, but the parcels are, you know, the houses are a little bit different. Um, and so there was a request. Um, there was, I think, one up near Crestview or something like that that had a request about that, um, that I would go through and take a look. So I did. I took a look, um, and my, my thought was, I think we're okay with the front setback. Um, and the side setbacks of 15 feet. Um, remember, a 15 foot setback means you're 15 feet from the side and they're 15 feet from the side. So every house is about 30 feet from the, from the next house. That starts to really start to push things apart um, and maybe push them apart unnecessarily. And the front yard setback is from the edge of the right of way. So not the edge of the street. Correct. So, so did did we get an answer for Aaron there? Like, uh, do we is is there a number set, or are we supposed to be? Uh, I wouldn't change the front. Um, they didn't give me a number. I wouldn't give a number. I think I would leave the front alone. Uh, if you want me to give a number, I could. You know, we could change the the twenty feet to fifteen feet if you want, and change the fifteen foot side to a ten foot side. Um, I don't think it would hurt to move the to to be closer on the side. Um, okay, so so fifteen to ten on the side is what Mike's suggesting. 
Um, how do people feel? Um, and do you want to do the front as well? I think stay simpler, just do the side. I think Mike is reasonable on it. I'd say take that to the public. Anyone else have a thought? I agree with Marcella. Yeah, that's fine with me. Okay. All right. So we'll Great. jump on to number five and see if we can get through this one, this last one. Um, so it's a little bit confusing, and I will try if the picture you have in front of you on the screen, you'll see the red line is route two. Just to orient you, you'll see in a little letters, a little Gallison Hill coming out. And there's this big empty line that's kind of floating through there, um, just above Gallison Hill, and it kind of hooks up there. That is the now abandoned rail line. And that is the, the issue at hand. So the folks that are in the industrial park there, which you see, uh, Cabot Creamery and all those, um, you see those buildings are right on the rail line um, or the boundary, the property line of the rail boundary. But there is a 20 foot setback from the front and 20 feet from the side. So they would have to, any new buildings would have to be 20 feet from that rail line. And the people who um, are, are own that property asked to make that zero. So, uh, I mean, so you can see the image, you can see there's a lot of parcels in here on the abandoned rail line. Um, there's nothing that goes on there. So I think I put a number of, of options in my memo. Um, and I think the one that I would probably suggest was number four, which was um, to add a rail setback. Um, would probably be the cleanest and I would suggest five feet. That would allow um, room for maintenance on the building without having to go on the rail property, unless if they want to go out and do the homework and get permission from the railroad, um, then we could make it zero. Uh, I, I'd be happy making it zero. It's going to be vacant land indefinitely into the future, so it it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to um, to whatever. But I don't think I can justify allowing somebody to build a zero lot line building. Um, and automatically assume that the rail division is going to give them permission to maintain their building into the future. So I think we have to at least have a five foot setback. Anyone have any thoughts Mike, about number, number four? Go ahead, Aaron. Mike, do you, do you have examples of other places where there's a five foot setback against uh, rail property? Um, no, so this was only going to apply in the Eastern Gateway Farm and Forest District um, up up in that picture. So that picture was um, included most of those uh, properties. You can see a lot of them are already on, you know, there's a lot of buildings already on the rail line. Um, so that was kind of the the thought. And there are a couple other abandoned rail lines that you don't even know are abandoned rail lines until you look at the map. Um, you know, there's an abandoned rail line between um, Casella, I believe, and Agway. So you don't even see it there, but there's another one there that they would have to be 20 feet away from in order to do any development. So it kind of makes sense where these little abandoned rail lines squiggle their way through that we would, you know, kind of allow some development that's that's a little bit closer to that property line, considering they're that they're probably not going to give up that property. Um, what, what do people think about about uh, possibly following Mike's number four suggestion of adding a five foot rail setback? 
I think that makes inches. sense. I mean, five feet seems like not quite enough room to do any maintenance, but <laughs> maybe it is. Hmm. They could paint the building at least. Yeah, yeah. The five it's probably feet enough. Seems, seems a minimum, certainly. I mean, the, they, they'll, they will be at the next meeting. I'm sure they'll make their case one way or the other. I will, I will, you know, I'll be inviting them, um, Alicia, to the meeting. So I'm sure she will um, speak up vociferously in, in defense of her, um, uh, the property owner's interests. So, um, you know, I think at least the five feet um, gives me an ability to draft something. So again, a part of another thing that has to happen between now and when I warn it is I have to take any of these answers that I get and I actually have to do the strikeout copy of the zoning. So that was why some of these I have to give you a memo to start with because I don't know what I'm writing until I hear from you guys. And if you guys say make it five feet, I can make it five feet. And we can change it afterwards once we hear testimony from the applicant. Okay, um, let's just let's just do that for now. It doesn't sound like there's a um, strong uh, you know, yeah, I agree. Here. Five, five so let's just makes sense. move along. Yeah. So, so number six is the PUDs. Yes. So number six and number seven are kind of related. Um, number seven we've talked about many times, so we can we can skip it because you know what I'm asking. Um, number six is um, it's not in here. I emailed it late, and I apologize. Um, because I didn't have it at home and I had to come into work to get it, but it was a PDF of the two PUD sections that we are recommending. Um, so we've worked these out. Um, there they are. So I'll just highlight what the two are. So the first one is a general planned unit development. And the second one is what we call a footprint type PUD. So general PUDs are what most communities have and really what it says is if you want to cluster you have 20 acres and two acre zoning so you've got 10 possible units I'm going to cluster all my development down to half acre lots I'm going to put them all down here and I'm going to conserve the rest um, I don't want any density bonuses I don't want anything special I'm just clustering down the lots because it saves on infrastructure costs uh, it conserves open space. Uh, it has a lot of benefits. So that's what a general PUD is. Um, so uh, I, I'm not going to go through line by line on these. We have a couple of questions that, that Meredith and I are still kind of working out from a technical standpoint. But that's what it is. It is a subdivision where you're clustering the lots into smaller, smaller pieces in order to um, make more efficient use of the land. Um, so what we need to have are some rules on use. There are no special use requirements. Remember, when we had all of ours, and we do still have all of ours, they have all these other use special uses. You get no bonus uses, no bonus densities, just allowed to make smaller lots, smaller setbacks um, in order to fit all the structures in. Um, there's some requirements that talk about how do you manage common land. If you have common land, there's always an unbuilt piece. So how is that unbuilt piece going to be managed? Um, so there are basic questions like that that are in section 4301. 4302 is what is called a footprint type PUD or a condominium PUD. There's a lot of names you can put to it. What this, what makes this one slightly different is you're, you're talking about sharing a number of, of pieces. So what you will do is um, you may be in a condominium, um, uh, Murray Hill. Um, we're going to make townhouses. Um, you own your townhouse. It's the land is subdivided. So the difference between, you know, one type of condo is um, a condo can go through and say, you don't own the building. You only own inside the walls. Um, and you pay association dues, the building is owned by the association, but you own your unit, but only to the extent that um, you own that piece, but you don't, there, the land isn't subdivided. In this case, the land is subdivided. 
but you still share resources. So there's a common parking lot. There's a common, you know, usually they're really small. They, they're footprint. That's why they call them footprint. They just go just around the outside of the building. Um, and they're pretty common. They're very common if you are in a place like Stowe or Smugs or Killington. It's very common if you have a, a you know, a timeshare, you're going to probably own the you'll you'll be a condominium owner of that building in it, and it's a footprint. And so this just is another option you will see people use from time to time is um, and the big question between a condo and a footprint type PUD just comes down to the question of are you subdividing the land or are you subdividing the building? If you're only subdividing the building and not subdividing the land, you don't need to do this. If you want to subdivide and own the land under your townhouse, then you need to go through this. Um, and that's, they're just two, two basic types. So this just goes through that spe those special rules because there's a little bit more shared thing. So we have to have a little bit more review of how these, um, you know, usually your parking is shared and your, uh, your recreation areas are shared because, you know, you literally just own the building. So you have to provide for recreational opportunities and you have to provide for these other things. So that's a little bit of the difference between um, these two new ones that we would be creating. And I don't know if people want me to go into more detail than that, um, that they're certainly all written out here if people have want to review them over the next couple of weeks and come prepared with some questions, we'll, we'll get a final draft out. But again, no, do, no density bonuses for either one of these. Um, and then number seven is, I'm, I'm going to charge the windmill again for number seven and try to eliminate under the new neighborhood development, the required new neighborhood development and under the conservation subdivision, the required conservation subdivision. Um, you know, part of these are, again, going to come down to projects such as the one on the hill where these guys are looking um, Habitat for Humanity doesn't want a density bonus, doesn't need a density bonus. They want to do a PUD. They're going to do a PUD, but because of the neighborhood they're in, they're going to be required to do a PUD. And that's going to mess them all up again. So it's just this repeated thing of stop forcing people into these PUDs. Um, if we can strike the required PUDs um, and just if people want to do them, if you want a density bonus, if you want to get more than you're otherwise allowed, you have to jump through a lot of hoops and do more. And if you don't want those density bonuses, then then you can use a general PUD or you can use a footprint PUD. And so once again, that's what number seven is. We're back. We've had this discussion before. You know my arguments. Um, so that's what number seven is. Did, did anyone have anything to say about six or seven? I guess I'm just, the challenge for me is that I don't think it's the right incentive. I think we've talked about this before and saying that density should be something you have to work for isn't, I don't want to make people work for density. I want more density. So <laughs> that feels like the wrong incentive to me. Yeah, that's, it's pretty much been what I've tried to, to advocate is that I've tried to set up the zoning continuously, keep improving it to get people to the easiest path is to do what we want them to do. And the hardest path is, you know, so we did, we set up the waivers. You know, we don't want people um, building these, these oversized, uh, you know, buildings. So we set footprints such that, hey, if you meet our footprint requirement, um, great. Uh, if you want more than that, then you got to go to the DRB. And it kind of encourages people to meet that requirement. Um, it makes it harder to not meet the requirement as opposed to it, this, which actually makes it harder to do what you want them to do. I think the challenge with it is, is that the, I don't think when this was passed, anyone realistically expected that the, the benefits provided by um, the, the density bonuses were going to be, were like why this was being passed. I think it was like a type of compromise and a trying to work with a lot of the neighbors and people who had showed up with concerns around the design of the neighborhoods. So it, it um, 
I feel like that's some of the background behind it. It wasn't, it wasn't like, here's an incentive to do this. It was, there's a lot of concerns about these properties being developed in a way that, um, that people won't like. And the, the design of the new neighborhood and the rural UD sort of tried to address those specifically. So it was like, well, we would feel less bad about this if we were assured that X percentage would be dedicated to open space. Then it's like, well, okay, yeah, we can live with more housing units here if we know that this space will be kept open. That helps. Thank you, John. I think that um, I think I agree with what Mike's saying in number seven here. Um, it this seems like a classic like problem that that I've started to learn is is part of planning sometimes, where it's just where you try to plan in the abstract, and then you make think requirements that in reality end up being bad ideas, but they happen because you plan in the abstract. Like giving the flexibility here, in number seven seems to me to be like a wiser course where it's more optional where we're not like saying ahead of time and out of context that it has to be a certain way. So that's, that's my thoughts about number seven. So if we're good with that, I can skip, we'll, we'll skip the next one really quick. Cause the number nine talks about a lot of technical fixes, which I don't think we, we need to go through each one of them. I think they were relatively self-explanatory. A lot of these are ones that come up as a result of different projects. Um, you know, somebody has an attached garage and we've got a question. So does the attached garage need to meet the primary structure setback or can the attached garage meet the accessory structure setback? because it's attached to the primary structure. So we've got these, anyways, that's just one of them. Some some little bit with signs. We had a couple of signs. We got a lot of sign issues. We got to fix our sign rules at some point, but um, there are a couple of little sign fixes that are in there to help clarify them. There's a question about front yard fences. So again, these are all interpretations. Somebody wants to put up a front yard fence. It's on. It's in front of the house, but it's on the side yard. Is that a front yard fence? or is that a side yard fence? This clarifies as to what, what, what rules apply. Um, there's just a little bit of uh, some landscaping applicability rules. Um, somebody goes through and replaces a lamp um, in the parking lot and next thing you know, they have to go and replace all the landscaping because they got non-conforming non landscaping. Uh, it's just you know a, a little thing to go through and say, hey, if you're, if you're doing something that's not affecting the ground, you don't have to do that. Um, so that's what a number of these are. Again, you're more than welcome to go through and review them and email me with questions. Um, number 10, we had adopted interim zoning, uh, interim river hazard rules and never made them permanent. So we are actually there, they've expired, um, but we need to go back and make them permanent. And uh, then there was just a reference in there to accessory structures. Um, we have a section that says you can't build structures unless it's allowed elsewhere. Well, the only place it's allowed elsewhere is in one place under accessory structures. So we might as well reference it because um, it doesn't come up very often and the zoning administrator kept missing it. So we wanted to just put a reference in there. And then I guess we can back up to eight, which is kind of Kirby's thing, um, which was the removal of residential densities from riverfront and residential 1500 districts. So the idea is kind of, I think Kirby introduced it a little bit already to let bulk and massing of structures limit the number of units that can be built rather than an arbitrary requirement. Um, I think we've had this conversation before. I don't think this is new. Um, you know, we, the two of us talked about it a little bit and, you know, my suggestion to him was that we, tr you know, it's already that way for urban center two or one, two and three. So if we wanted to extend it, um, I think it's going to be a controversial topic, but if we started with the next layer out, which would be riverfront and residential 1500, that could make sense as this to get the public used to the idea of we're just going to regulate bulk and massing in the riverfront district and in the um, 
in, in the 1500 district and um, not have a set density, which is one unit per 1500, which is 27 units an acre. So I don't know if it would be helpful, just, but I pulled out some slides from a presentation I gave a bunch of years ago. Um, and it used Montpelier as an example and focus on our, our last zoning changes. But I have in it, there's photos of like a whole bunch of different homes and what the densities are. And the point of it is to show sort of how meaningless density is or how people don't think it is what it um, think like. Anyways, I, I don't know if like, maybe framing things or if there's any utility in um, trying to use this and, and queuing up the discussion to kind of hit hit the oh, idea right. home that it's around de design and not density. Yeah, I think you'd have to unshare your screen, Kirby, if, if he was gonna pull that up. Yeah, do, 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 people, do people want that? I mean, it's, um, it's up to everyone else if they- How, how long is it? John, how, how long, is it a long PowerPoint? Uh, no. I'm just gonna I show mean, a few pictures. Says, yeah, it's as long as you want it to be. Uh, 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 I, I don't feel like I need convincing specifically, although I'm sure it's very interesting and I would love to see it. Uh, my question is around what, which, which neighborhoods are Res 1500? Can you remind me? I have the zoning map up, but. Yeah, I could try to pull it up and. I think that would be helpful here. so we know what neighborhoods we're talking about. Does this include, if we're taking out density, then does that include the floor area ratio as well? Or is this strictly residential density? I believe it was only going to be the residential density. So FAR would still be there? F FAR would remain. But Again, it's it's really up to to the proposal. Um, it could go either way. I mean, I was thinking residential density, but I'm of course completely open to how people want to adjust this. Just to, I think Mike covered everything that I would say. It's just the two main points are uh, use this as an opportunity to to talk about how dim dimensional limitations achieve our goals, density does not do a good job of that and, and can lead to us going against our own goals. Start that conversation. The second thing is this particular proposal is very incremental. These are already relatively high density places and we're just gonna go ahead and just remove the, the caps on there because they're arbitrary. And then after a period of time, a year or two, we'll see how you know this, this doesn't lead to any like negative. Like, and that's the idea is just getting people like around the understanding that that nothing bad is going to happen here. This is good stuff. Um, so the neighborhoods, can everyone see the, the map? Yeah, so it's the number eight that you see there. I don't know if there's a fourth one, but you can see three of them there. An eight one down by Monsignor Crosby. Um, an eight three that is over uh, Loomis St. Paul. Have to have so it's the, it's, it's the light and green. Then, oh, 8 is 2 is up actually Franklin Square, and 8 3 is the um, yeah. Paul Loomis. And then the orange is the riverfront, the dark orange. Yeah, the dark orange is the riverfront. And I think um, we'll have to have more of a conversation about that one because um, you know, the one elephant in the room on riverfront is that the lower portion of Saban's pasture is riverfront. So just making everybody aware that that proposal would, you know, have a potential, um, you know, and again, I'm, I'm not necessarily for it or against it. I think in, in concept, I like it as I look at it with my political hat on, um, I see, I see danger signs. Um, so yeah, and that's my hope. And maybe I'm I'm super optimistic here, but my hope is that maybe we can change the political attitudes to make people. To, it's, it's like a teaching moment. I think that 
that's great. I think just worthwhile, just even, again, I think trying to reframe the conversation, um, even if we do get a lot of negative feedback, I think it's worthwhile. And John, I wasn't clear on what exactly you were saying you had pictures of, but maybe that could be helpful in sharing in the public hearing. But I was a little confused about what you were saying. Yeah, so the idea was to try to bring it bring it to life and demystify what we're talking about. So I've got photos, you know, yeah. of homes around Montpelier and what their what their density is. And it's set up in a way where you can like you're supposed to guess how many. Um, I can yeah. I can share my screen and show you if you want. Go for it. Um, we have, we do in a few minutes here. Um, yeah, the whole idea of it is getting to like the origins of density in Vermont and how it came originally from public health and how we were industrializing coming to our downtown village centers, but sort of then uh, shifted to eugenics and, you know, keeping people different than us out of our neighborhoods. Um, skip through these things. Um, th this is, again, I don't think, you know, we'd want to go through all of these parts of it, but uh, this is just showing our revenue per acre and across Montpelier and the whole idea of how we've um, before and after zoning, like we've built, we've built our community that's far less uh, valuable or generating in terms of revenue and we've made it illegal to build sort of the, the most valuable parts of our country. And this again was like before our last zoning changes. Um, So here's my house, um, which is, you know, 17 and a half units an acre. Our neighbors, sorry, Charlie, for showing your house when you were putting primer all over the front of it, but uh, uh, 33 units an acre. Um, you know, just this is this is literally like a just all a, a walk I did five minutes outside of my house. So. This is a duplex at 10 units an acre. These are at seven and two units an acre. These are 40 units an acre. Uh, these are 12.5 and 18.5. This is 42 units an acre. And I think if you stop there, I think that was a, the, the good example for that one um, kind of goes to the point of what I think Kirby's um, proposal was, which is that that's a building of a fixed size. Um, and yet it could have um, it could have 15 units that are four bedroom units. It could have up to 80 studios, but they're all they're all fitting in the same box. So why do we ascribe density? when we could regulate the bulk and massing and say, let the free market decide how many units. In the past, most, most units were family units. Um, so you had, um, you know, um, if you were to look at our demographics, you'd see the number of people that were living alone was relatively low. Um, you were generally living with somebody else. Today, 30% is the largest group um, is people living alone. And yet there are, you know, if you were to look at a map of all of our available units, you'd see very few one, one bedroom in studios. Um, most of them are going to be two bedroom or three bedroom or their houses with multiple bedrooms. So um, the idea is if the market says we've got a lot of people who are single, I can put 80, 80 studios in this. Um, 
but the density, uh, the zoning only, would only allow 40 or 20 um, because we're counting dwelling units as opposed to just looking at the bulk and massing. Um, and you know that, that's, that's a little bit of what the conversation is. By removing the density and just regulating to bulk and massing, then we can say, however many you can fit, this is probably a non-conforming building on that street, but um, it's, it still gives an idea of, that's what we're talking about, is you don't know how many units are in that building. All you really care about is how, bi how big the building is and what does it look like. Right, and we would, you couldn't build this now anyway. Right, and so, so this is like, if you're scared of, of some big new thing, well, like, still not gonna happen if you change density, even though maybe it wouldn't be so bad. Yeah, this is 1.3 units. This is 36 units, you know, like what's the difference between this and this? 36 units an acre. <laughs> Anyways, these are some examples of maybe how density isn't a very good indicator of, of what the character of a neighborhood is. But because we've redefined density, we're not using it a units per acre. We are redefining it as square feet per dwelling unit. So we've kind of flipped it on the edge there that, um, you know, it might be helpful to go through those same examples, John, and say, okay, um, this is uh, this is in a district right now that's fifteen hundred or three thousand. So, um, you know, to to make it more in keeping with what our zoning is right now. Yeah, yeah, that would make sense. So, like, this is like two thousand, or so it's apples to apples if we're talking about. So they're not confused as. We're like, well, you, you're talking about 20 units an acre, but then you're talking about our 600 or whatever. So I don't know if it's use, useful or not. Um, this together a while back. And it could do more harm than good. I don't know. <laughs> I, no, I think it. I think it illustrates the point, and some people are visual like that. So for some people, I think it would it would help it hit home. Hey, could you just modify this to um, make it more of a comparison to our existing zoning? They just change the units. Like yeah. The, yeah, yeah. Just say, okay, this is in this district, and you know, or the multifamily one is in is in um you know res 6000 or something anyway yeah. um just to kind of make it apple as you said apples to apples so people have a really clear idea of this is what we have right now and is that what we really need right yeah thanks sean mm -hmm. does, uh, does anyone else have anything to say about the um about this this item, um, is this is this something people are interested in proceeding with and talking about at the hearing and possibly passing on city council? So, two questions from my perspective. One is um, everybody's comfortable with the riverfront proposal. And then the second one is, are we also eliminating FAR, which I think had been mentioned earlier? Um, because uh, FAR is usually, so that's floor area ratio. So that's looking at the percentage of the lot um, that can be used for non-residential, generally non-residential. It also applies to um, congregate living because congregate living doesn't have dwelling units to count. So mm. congregate living is measured in FAR. Um, so, but, um, do we stick to the same prescription for, um, commercial as well, just to go and regulate bulk and massing in the riverfront district? I mean, I'm, I'm concerned about housing. Um, but so I didn't, I didn't 
care much about FAR before, but now that you're talking about congregate living, maybe maybe that is a reason. What other people think? I guess I would recommend that you keep your argument as simple as possible. So maybe in keeping the FAR at least at this point um, and just going forth with one part of it, because uh, you're gonna have enough to argue about with that already. Okay, just one clarification, so. Do, do, do other people have thoughts? No, I, can, I can definitely see Barb's point. I think it's confusing for people if we're already gonna make a big change. So starting with, I think leaving that out for now makes sense. Okay. But I could right. probably be convinced the other way if I knew a little bit more about it. So <laughs> that's where I'm at. Yeah. <laughs> I could go either way too, but um, I, it, it, the whole thing's meant to be incremental, and so I'm fine with leaving it at the residential. Um, okay, well that went smoothly. Uh, let's hope that the hearing goes smoothly as well. Mike, do you need us to? Do you need us to vote on anything, or just just we're just save it for the hearing, right? No, I think I think unless there was unless there was something that was contentious that we felt we did not want to put forth, then I might say, you know, let's have a vote because it seemed to be a split decision on a point. But again, this doesn't commit anybody to supporting anything once it gets to public hearing. This is just what are we going to put on the public hearing? So I've got to go and now take what we had in the memo, finish the strikeout copy. Um, get that all set to go, um, get that back out to you guys, um, draft up a whole stack of public hearing notices to get out to everybody that is potentially impacted. Um, I probably won't send it to everybody in Res 9 when we're changing just the side setback a little bit, um, but everybody that is in Harrison Ave, who is surrounding or in the, the map change for Heaton and everybody who is in and around the map change for Northfield Street. Okay. And I think the only like point of clarification that I'm remembering is it seemed like more people were in favor of with numbers one and two, putting those with, with the neighborhood nine, three as, as the starting point or the baseline. Yes. For, the hearing. Yep. Yep. That's my no. Um, okay. Anyone have anything else before we adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Okay. We have a motion from Barb. Do we have a second? Second.